Today we're going to examine the essay called Stranger in the Village, written by James Baldwin in 1955, another reflective essay. The purpose of this is to generate potential topics for writing a reflective essay, and also to analyze a reflective essay for content, style, and craft. So to quickly preview the text, um, you should be on springboard page, let's find out, 69. Um, it's a very long essay, it's 11 pages long it looks like, so things that you should look for are how does shooting an elephant address um, the stranger in the village concept? So like, take a few minutes and brainstorm. How did Orwell, oops, I just I have a typo here. How did Orwell um, cast himself in the role of stranger in the village in his essay? Now I want you to skim the text first for length and unfamiliar words. So take a moment and flip through your springboard book. Um, there are footnotes there to help you understand words that you might not be familiar with. And then consider why words such as sight, stranger, village, and neger Negger, okay, it's a bad word, sorry, are repeated often throughout the text. There is going to be the N-word in here, so I apologize, but it's, it's written that way on purpose. So um, I would use context clues to understand the italicized words, and if you have any trouble, just ask me during class. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, the author, James Baldwin, uh, died in 1987, and he was born in Harlem into a poor household headed by his rigid and demanding stepfather, a storefront preacher. Though he had planned to follow his stepfather's footsteps and had served as a junior minister, he eventually became disillusioned with Christianity and resolved to become a writer. His move to Paris in 1948 helped provide the critical distance he needed to write the autobiographical Notes of a Native Son and his first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, powerful works about the African-American experience. After returning to the U.S., he became a leading literary voice for civil rights. While his unsparing view of race issues in the U.S. drew criticism from his African-American and white peers alike, he is now viewed as one of the most significant U.S. writers of the 20th century. So this man is an African-American, and he uses the N-word to create a point. Um, this is a very complex essay because he is going to be writing about being a stranger in the village, but also um, the effect of feeling like a stranger in the village when you're not actually a stranger. So we're going to begin now um, by previewing the first questions. For paragraph one, the question you'll need to answer is what is the event and its significance? From all available evidence, no black man had ever set foot in this tiny Swiss village before I came. I was told before arriving that I would probably be a site for the village. I took this to mean that people of my complexion were rarely seen in Switzerland and also that city people are always something of a site outside of the city. It did not occur to me, possibly because I am an American, that there could be people anywhere who had never seen a Negro. This is the question you need to answer. What is the, what is the event and its significance? In the next set, um, we're going to focus on style, craft, and content. Um, the type of question I'm asking is noted in the parentheses. What is the function of the details about the village and its people? How does Baldwin use these details to impact the reader? What is the effect of Baldwin's syntax, sentence structure, in which he juxtaposes simple and complex sentences? Juxtaposes means um, compares. Okay. It is a fact that cannot be explained on the basis of the inaccessibility of the village. The village is very high, but it is only four hours from Milan and three hours from Lausanne. It is true that it is virtually unknown. Few people making plans for holiday would elect to come here. On the other hand, the villages are able presumably to come and go as they please, which they do to another town at the foot of the mountain with a population of approximately 5,000, the nearest place to see a movie or go to the bank. In the village there is no movie house, no bank, no library, no theater, very few radios, one jeep, one station wagon, and at the moment one typewriter, mine, an invention which the woman next door to me here had never seen. There are about 600 people living here, all Catholic. I conclude this from the fact that the Catholic Church is open all year round, whereas the Protestant chapel, set off on a hill a little removed from the village, is only open in the summertime when the tourists arrive. There are four or five hotels, all closed now, and four or five bistros, of which, however, only two do any business during the winter. These two do not do a great deal, uh, do not do a great deal, for life in the village seems to end around nine or ten o'clock. There are a few stores, butcher, baker, epicery, a hardware store, and a money changer who cannot change traveler's checks, but must send them down to the bank, an operation which takes two or three days. There is something called the ballet house, 
closed in the winter and used for God knows what, certainly not ballet during the summer. There seems to be only one schoolhouse in the village, and this is for the quite young children. I suppose this to mean that their older brothers and sisters at some point descend from these mountains in order to complete their education, possibly again to the town just below. The landscape is absolutely forbidding, mountains towering on all four sides, ice and snow as far as the eye can reach. In this white wilderness, men and women and children move all day, carrying, washing, wood, buckets of milk or water, sometimes skiing on Sunday afternoons. All week long and young men, sorry, all week long, boys and young men are to be seen shoveling snow off the rooftops or dragging wood down from the forest in sleds. The village's only real attraction, which explains the tourist season, is the hot spring water. A disquietingly high proportion of these tourists are cripples or semi-cripples who come year after year, from other parts of Switzerland usually, to take the waters. This lends the village, at the height of the season, a rather terrifying air of sanctity, as though it were a lesser lord, uh, lords. I'm saying that wrong, sorry. There is often something beautiful. There is always something awful in the spectacle of a person who has lost one of his faculties, a faculty he never questioned until it was gone and who struggles to recover it. Yet people remain people on crutches or indeed on deathbeds. And wherever I passed, the first summer I was here, among the native villagers or among the lame, a wind passed with me of astonishment, curiosity, amusement, and outrage. That first summer I stayed two weeks and never intended to return. But I did return in the winter to work. The village offers obviously no distraction whatsoever and has the further advantage of being extremely cheap. Now it is winter again. A year later, I am here again. Everyone in the village knows my name, though they scarcely ever use it, knows that I come from America, though this apparently they will never really believe. Black men come from Africa, and everyone knows that I am the friend of the son of a woman who was born here and that I am staying in their chalet. But I remain as much a stranger today as I was the first day I arrived, and the children shout, Negger, Negger, as I walk along the streets. These are your questions to revisit for those last two paragraphs. For paragraphs four through five, here are your three questions. What is the significance of the last sentence in paragraph four? So please pay attention to that. Discuss the content and significance of James Joyce's quote at the end of paragraph five. What does it contribute to Baldwin's reflection? Finally, characterize Baldwin's tone or attitude as he writes, excuse me, as he writes about the village. Please cite at least one example of diction from the text that supports his tone. So kind of a little TP cast action here. Okay, now we're going to read the next two paragraphs. It must be admitted that in the beginning, I was far too shocked to have any real reaction. In so far as I reacted at all, I reacted by trying to be pleasant, it being a great part of the American Negro's education, long before he goes to school, that he must make people like him. This smile and the world smiles with you routine worked about as well in this situation as it had in the situation for which it was designed, which is to say that it did not work at all. No one, after all, can be liked whose human weight and complexity cannot be or has not been admitted. My smile was simply another unheard of phenomenon which allowed them to see my teeth. They did not really see my smile, and I began to think that should I take to snarling, no one would notice any difference. All of the physical characteristics of the Negro, which had caused me in America a very different and almost forgotten pain, were nothing less than miraculous or infernal in the eyes of the village people. Some thought my hair was the color of tar, that it had, tech, I'm sorry, that it had the texture of wire or the texture of cotton. I was jocularly suggested that I might let it all grow long and make myself a winter coat. If I sat in the sun for more than five minutes, some daring creature was certain to come along and gingerly put his fingers on my hair as though he were afraid of an electric shock or put his hand on my hand, astonished that the color did not rub off. In all of this, in which it must be concealed, I'm sorry, conceded, there was the charm of genuine wonder and in which there was no, sorry, in which there was certainly no element of intentional unkindness, there was yet no suggestion that I was human. I was simply a living wonder. I knew that they did not mean to be unkind, and I know it now. It is necessary, nevertheless, for me to repeat this to myself each time that I walk out of the chalet. The children who shout, Negger, have no way of knowing the echoes 
this stone raises in me. They are brimming with good humor and the more daring swell with pride when I stop to speak with them. Just the same, there are days when I cannot pause and smile, when I have no heart to play with them, when indeed I mutter sourly to myself, exactly as I muttered on the streets of a city these children have never seen, when I was no bigger than these children are now. Your mother was a nigger. Joyce is right about history being a nightmare, but it may be the nightmare from which no one can awaken. People are trapped in history, and history is trapped in them. Please revisit these are your questions to answer about those two paragraphs. Next. These are the three questions to answer about the next three paragraphs. Discuss the irony of the village's custom oh, yeah, yeah, as it resonates with Baldwin in his reflection. Number nine, identify the tone of the last sentence of paragraph six, so pay attention to that. And what is the effect of the syntactical structure, the sentence structure, of the last sentence in paragraph nine? Oops, sorry. So we're going to continue and look for answers to those questions. There is a custom in the village. I am told it is repeated in many villages of buying African natives for the purpose of converting them to Christianity. There stands in the church all year round a small box with a slot for money decorated with a black figurine and into this box the villagers drop their francs. During the carnival, which precedes Lent, two village children have their faces blackened, out of which bloodless darkness their blue eyes shine like ice, and fantastic horsehair wigs are placed on their blonde heads. Thus disguised, they solicit among the villagers for money, for missionaries in Africa. Sorry, in Africa. And between the box and the church and the blackened children, the village bought last year six or eight African natives. This was reported to me with pride by the wife of one of the bistro owners, and I was careful to express astonishment and pleasure at the solicitude shown by the village for the souls of black folks. The bistro owner's wife beamed with a pleasure far more genuine than my own and seemed to feel that I might now breathe more easily concerning the souls of at least six of my kinsmen. I tried not to think of these so lately baptized kinsmen, of the price paid for them, or the peculiar price they themselves would pay, and said nothing about my father, who, having taken his own conversion too literally, never at bottom forgave the white world, which he described as heathen, for having saddled him with a Christ in whom, to judge at least from their treatment of him, they themselves no longer believed. I thought of white men arriving for the first time in an African village, strangers there, as I am a stranger here, and tried to imagine the astounded populace touching their hair and marveling at the color of their skin. But there is a great difference between being the first white man to be seen by Africans and being the first black man to be seen by whites. The white man takes the astonishment as tribute, for he arrives to conquer and to convert the natives, whose inferiority in relation to himself is not even to be questioned, whereas I, without a thought of conquest, find myself among a people whose culture controls me, has even in a sense created me, people who have cost me more in anguish and rage than they will ever know, who yet do not even know of my existence. The astonishment with which I might have greeted them, should they have stumbled into my African village a few hundred years ago, might have rejoiced their hearts, but the astonishment with which they greet me today can only poison mine. And this is so despite everything I may do, sorry, and this is so despite everything I may do to feel differently, despite my friendly conversations with the bistro owner's wife, despite their three-year-old son who has at last become my friend, despite the salutes and bonsoirs which I exchange with the people as I walk, despite the fact that I know that no individual can be taken to task for what history is doing or has done. I say that the culture of these people controls me, but they can scarcely be held responsible for European culture. America comes out of Europe, but these people have never seen America, nor have most of them seen more of Europe than the hamlet at the foot of their mountain. Yet they move with an authority which I shall never have, and they regard me quite rightly, not only as a stranger in their village, but as a suspect late comer, bearing no credentials, 
to everything they have, however, unconsciously inherited. For this village, even were it in, I'm sorry, for this village, even were it incomparably more remote and incredibly more primitive, is the West, the West onto which I have been so strangely grafted. These people cannot be, from the point of view of power, strangers anywhere in the world. They have made the modern world in effect, even if they do not know it. The most illiterate among them is related in a way that I am not to Dante, Shakespeare, Michelangelo. I can't say this guy's name. Da Vinci, Rembrandt, and Racine. The cathedral at, I can't say that either, says something to them which it cannot say to me, as indeed would New York's Empire State Building should anyone here ever see it. Out of their hymns and dances come Beethoven and Bach. Go back a few centuries and they are in their full glory. But I am in Africa watching the conquerors arrive. Okay, so these are your questions, just to revisit those. Okay, your next questions for paragraphs 10 through 13. How is the stranger in the village theme conveyed here? Like, how is it, how is it put out? How, is, how does it come across? How does the author organize this section to advance the theme of the essay? So you need to be like thinking about the theme. And what words are repeated in paragraph 10? How does this add new emotional layers to the tone? So stop and think first, what is the tone so far? The rage of the disesteemed is personally fruitless, but it is also absolutely inevitable. This rage, so generally discounted, so little understood, even among the people whose daily bread it is, is one of the things that makes history. Rage can only with difficulty and never entirely be brought under the dom uh, domination of the intelligence, and it is therefore not susceptible to any arguments whatsoever. This is a fact which ordinary representatives of the Herrenvolk, which is master race, having never felt this rage and being unable to imagine it, quite fail to understand. Also, rage cannot be hidden. It can only be dissembled. This dissembling deludes the thoughtless and strengthens rage and adds to rage contempt. There are no doubt as many ways of coping with the resulting complex of tensions as there are black men in the world, but no black man can hope ever to be entirely liberated from this internal warfare, rage, dissembling, and contempt, having inevitably accompanied his first realization of the power of white men. What is crucial here is that since white men represent in the black man's world so heavy a weight, white men have for black men a reality which is far from being reciprocal, and hence all black men have toward all white men an attitude which is designed really neither, either, sorry, either to rob the white man of the jewel of his naivete or else to make it cost him dear. The black man insists by whatever means he finds at his disposal that the white man cease to regard him as an exotic rarity and recognize him as a human being. This is a very charged and difficult moment for there is a great deal of willpower involved in the white man's naivete. Most people are not naturally reflective any more than they are naturally malicious. And the white man prefers to keep the black man at a certain human remove because it is easier for him thus to preserve his simplicity and avoid being called to account for crimes committed by his forefathers or his neighbors. He is inescapably aware, nevertheless, that he is in a better position in the world than black men are, nor can he quite put to death the suspicion that he is hated by black men, therefore. He does not wish to be hated, neither does he wish to change places, and at this point in his uneasiness can he scarcely avoid having recourse to those legends which white men have created about black men, the most usual effect of which is that the white man finds himself enmeshed, so to speak, in his own language, which describes hell, as well as the attributes which lead one to hell, as being black as night. Every legend, moreover, contains its residuum of truth, and the root function of language is to control the universe by describing it. It is of quite considerable significance that black men remain on the imagination and in overwhelming numbers, in fact, beyond the disciplines of salvation, and, is, and this despite the fact that the West has been buying African natives for centuries. There is, I should hazard, an instantaneous necessity to be divorced from this so visibly unsaved stranger in whose heart, moreover, one cannot guess what dreams of vengeance are, are being nourished. And at the same time, there are few things on earth more attractive than the idea of the unspeakable liberty which is allowed the unredeemed. 
When beneath the black mask, a human being begins to make himself felt, one cannot escape a certain awful wonder as to what kind of human being it is. What one's imagination makes of other people is dictated, of course, by the laws of one's own personality, and it is one of the ironies of the black-white relations that by means of what the white man imagines the black man to be, the black man is enabled to know who the white man is. I have said, for example, that I am as much a stranger in this village today as I was the first summer I arrived. But this is not quite true. The villagers wonder less about the texture of my hair than they did then and wonder rather more about me. And the fact that their wonder now exists on another level is reflected in their attitudes and in their eyes. There are the children who make those delightful, hilarious, sometimes astonishingly grave overtures of friendship in the unpredictable fashion of children. Other children, having been taught that the devil is a black man, scream in genuine anguish as I approach. Some of the older women never pass without a friendly greeting. Never pass indeed if it seems that they will be able to engage me in conversation. So they avoid him. Other women look down or look away or rather contemptuously smirk. Some of the men drink with me and suggest I learn how to ski. Partly I gather because they cannot imagine what I would look like on skis and want to know if I am married and ask questions about my I don't know what that word means. But some of uh, men have accused the sale nigger behind my back of stealing wood. And there's already in the eyes of some of them the peculiar intent paranoiac malevolence which one sometimes surprises in the eyes of an American white man when out walking with their Sunday girl they see a Negro male approach. All right so um, we just read 10 through 13 here are the questions that you need to answer and the next one this is where it starts to get like really to the point paragraphs 14 through 15 here are your three questions discuss the new description of the village in which Baldwin is a stranger how does Baldwin's diction advance his tone and or theme? Why is Baldwin's thesis presented in three sentences? I'm sorry, that should say in paragraph 14. What effect does the syntax of his paragraph have on the reader? Okay, so this is his thesis coming up in uh, paragraph 14. There is a dreadful abyss between the streets of this village and the streets of the city in which I was born, between the children who shout nigger today and those who shouted nigger yesterday. The abyss is experience, the American experience. The syllable hurled behind me today expresses above all wonder. I am a stranger here, but I am not a stranger in America. And the same syllable riding on the American air expresses the war my presence has occasioned in the American soil, sorry, in the American soul. For this village brings home to me this fact that there was a day, and not really a very distant day, when Americans were scarcely Americans at all, but discontented Europeans facing a great unconquered continent and strolling, say, into a marketplace and seeing black men for the first time. The shock this spectacle afforded is suggested surely by the promptness with which they decided that these black men were not really men, but cattle. It is true that the necessity on the part of the settlers of the New World of reconciling their moral assumptions with the fact and the necessity of slavery enhanced immensely the charm of this idea. And it is also true that this idea expresses that the truly American bluntness, the attitude which to varying extents all masters have had toward all slaves. Okay, um, so these are your three questions about 14 through 15. Um, I want you for paragraph 14 to paraphrase the last sentence. So in your, wherever you're answering your questions, I want you to paraphrase that to put that in your own words and then discuss the effect of the last sentence, the thesis of the essay. So this is back to paragraph 14. And I just want to point out, um, they wanted to discuss, they in the curriculum, want to discuss how paragraph 14 relates to the essay. And of course you haven't read it all yet, but paragraph 14 kind of connects the first part of the essay about Baldwin being a stranger in Switzerland to the second part where he's going to sort of talk about this more complex relationship between he and African Americans being in America. Because really in America they're not strangers, but the treatment is similar. It's kind of like what we brainstormed at the beginning of class about what it means to be a stranger in the village. So take a moment to work on that. Oh, I forgot to label this. Man, am I good at PowerPoints or what? And then for the remainder of the essay, 
I'd like you to mark the text for the use of the word American or Ameri America or Americans. What does this repetition tell us about his purpose and his audience? And kind of like come back to like that theme of what he means. So for 18 in your book, I want you to just kind of mark the use of this word and then um, maybe just like a sentence about what it, um, what it says about its pur his purpose and audience. Okay, so I'm going to continue reading now through the end of this um, presentation and let me know if you have any questions. Okay. We have about, um, I can't remember how many paragraphs, about 10 more, well, less than 10 more paragraphs to go. Okay, sorry. But between all former slaves and slave owners and the drama which begins for Americans over 300 years ago at Jamestown, there are at least two differences to be observed. The American Negro slave could not suppose, for one thing, as slaves in past epochs had supposed and often done, that he would ever be able to wrest the power from his master's hands. This was a superstition which the modern era, which was to bring about uh, such vast changes in the aims and dimensions of power, put to death. It only begins in unprecedented fashion and with dreadful implications to be resurrected today. But even had this supposition persisted with undiminished force, the American Negro slave could not have used it to lend his condition dignity for the reason that this supposition rests on another, that the slave in exile yet remains related to his past has some means, if only in memory, of revering and sustaining the forms of his former life, is able, in short, to maintain his identity. This was not the case with the American Negro slave. He is unique among the black men of the world in that his past was taken from him, almost literally at one blow. What wonders what on earth the first slave found to say to the first dark child he bore? I am told that there are Haitians able to trace their ancestry back to African kings, but any American Negro wishing to go back so far will find his journey through time abruptly arrested by the signature on the bill of sale which served as the entrance paper for his ancestor. At the time, to say nothing of the circumstances of the enslavement of the captive black man who was to become the American Negro, there was not the remotest possibility that he would ever take power from his master's hands. There was no reason to suppose that his situation would ever change, nor was there surely anything to indicate that his situation had ever been different. It was his necessity, in the words of E. Frank and Frazier, to find, quote, a motive for living under American culture or die. The identity of the American Negro comes out of this extreme situation, and the evolution of this identity was a source of the most intolerable anxiety in the minds and the lives of his masters. For the history of the American Negro is unique also in this, that the question of his humanity and of his rights, therefore, as a human being, became a burning one for several generations of Americans, so burning a question that it ultimately became one of those used to divide the nation. It is out of this argument that the venom of the epithet nigger is derived. It is an argument which Europe has never had, and hence Europe quite sincerely fails to understand how or why the argument arose in the first place, why its effects are so frequently disastrous and always so unpredictable, why it refuses until today to be entirely settled. Europe's black possessions remained and do remain in Europe's colonies, at which remove they represented no threat whatsoever to European identity. If they posed any problem at all for the European conscience, it was a problem which remained, un I'm sorry, comfor comfortingly abstract. In effect, the black man as a man did not exist for Europe. But in America, even as a slave, he was an inescapable part of the general social fabric, and no American could escape having an attitude toward him. Americans attempt until today to make an abstraction of the Negro, but the very nature of these abstractions reveals the tremendous effect the presence of the Negro has had on the American character. When one considers the history of the Negro in America, it is of the greatest importance to recognize that the moral beliefs of a person or a people are never really as tenuous as life, which is not moral. Very often causes them to appear, these create for them a frame of reference and a necessary hope, the hope being that when life has done its worst, they will be enabled to rise above themselves and to triumph over life. Life would scarcely be bearable if this hope did not exist. Again, even when the worst has been said to betray a belief is not by any means to have put oneself beyond its power, the betrayal of a belief is not the same thing as ceasing to believe. If this were not so, there would be no moral standards in the world at all. Yet, one must also recognize that morality is based on ideas and that all ideas are dangerous. Dangerous because ideas can only lead to action and where the action leads, no man can stay. 
and dangerous in this respect, that confronted with the impossibility of remaining faithful to one's beliefs and the equal impossibility of becoming free of them, one can be driven to the most inhuman excesses. The ideas on which American beliefs are based are not, though Americans often seem to think so, ideas which originated in America. They came out of Europe, and the establishment of democracy on the American continent was scarcely as radical a break with the past as was the necessity which Americans faced of broadening this concept to include black men. This was literally a hard necessity. It was impossible, for one thing, for Americans to abandon their beliefs, not only because these beliefs alone seemed able to justify the sacrifices that they had endured and the blood that they had spilled, but also because these beliefs afforded them their only bulwark against a moral chaos as absolute as the physical chaos of the continent. It was their destiny to conquer. But in the situation in which Americans found themselves, these beliefs threatened an idea which, whether or not one likes to think so, is the very warp and woof of the heritage of the West, the idea of white supremacy. Almost done. Americans have made themselves notorious by the shrillness and the brutality by which they have insisted on this idea, but they did not invent it, and it has escaped the world's notice that those very excesses of which Americans have been guilty imply a certain unprecedented uneasiness over the ideas life and power, if not indeed the idea's validity. The idea of white supremacy rests simply on the fact that white men are the creators of civilization, the present civilization, which is the only one that matters. Previous civilizations are simply contributions to our own, and are therefore civilization's guardians and defenders. Thus it was impossible for Americans to accept the black man as one of themselves, for to do so was to jeopardize their status as white men. But not so to accept him, was to deny his human reality, his human weight and complexity, and the strain of denying the overwhelmingly undeniable forced Americans into rationalization so fantastic that they approached the pathological. At the root of the American Negro problem is the necessity of the American white man to find a way of living with the Negro in order to be able to live with himself. And the history of this problem can be reduced to the means used by Americans lynch law and law, segregation and legal acceptance, terrorization and concession, either to come to terms with this necessity or to find a way around it, or most usually to find a way of doing both these things at once. The resulting spectacle, at once foolish and dreadful, led someone to make the quite accurate observation that, quote, the Negro in America is a form of insanity which overtakes white men. In this long battle, a battle by no means finished, the unforeseeable effects of which will be felt by many future generations, the white man's motive was the protection of his identity. The black man was motivated by the need to establish an identity. And despite the terrorization which the Negro in America endured and endures sporadically until today, despite the cruel and totally inescapable ambivalence of his status in the country, and the battle for his identity has long ago been won, the battle for his identity has long ago been won. He is not a visitor to the West, but a citizen there, an American, as American as the Americans who despised him, the Americans who fear him, the Americans who love him, the Americans who became less than themselves or rose to be greater than themselves by virtue of the fact that the challenge he represented was inescapable. He is perhaps the only black man in the world whose relationship to white men is more terrible, more subtle, and more meaningful than the relationship of bitter possessed to uncertain possessors. His survival depended, and his development depends on his ability to turn his peculiar status in the Western world to his own advantage. It may be to the very great advantage of that world. It remains for him to fashion out of his experience that which gave him sustenance and a voice. The cathedral at wherever I have said says something to the peoples of this village which it cannot say to me, but it is important to understand that this cathedral says something to me which it cannot say to them. Perhaps they are struck by the power of the spires, the glory of the windows, but they have known God after all longer than I have known him, and in a different way, and I am terrified by the slippery bottomless well to be found in the crypt down which heretics were hurled to death, and by the obscene and escapable gargoyles jutting out of the stone and seeming to say that God and the devil can never be divorced. I doubt that the villagers think of the devil when they face a cathedral, because they have never been identified with the devil. Oh, we're going to please excuse the interruption. Pause. Sorry, it's going to get loud in a minute. 
but I must accept the status which myth, if nothing else, gives me in the West before I can hope to change the myth, finally. Yet if the African, I'm sorry, yet if the American Negro has arrived at his identity by virtue of the absoluteness of his estrangement from his past, American white men still nourish the illusion that there is some means of recovering the European innocence, of returning to a state in which black men do not exist. This is one of the greatest errors Americans can make. The identity they fought so hard to protect has by virtue of that battle undergone a change. Americans are as unlike any other white people in the world as it is possible to be. I do not think, for example, that it is too much to suggest that American vision of that the American vision of the world, which allows so little reality, generally speaking, for any of the darker forces in human life, which tends until today to paint moral issues in glaring black and white, owes a great deal to the battle waged by Americans to maintain between themselves and black men a human separation which could not be bridged. It is only now beginning to be born on sorry, to be born in on us very faintly, it must be admitted very slowly and very much against our will that this vision of the world is dangerously inaccurate and perfectly useless, for it protects our moral high-mindedness at the terrible expense of weakening our grasp of reality. People who shut their eyes to reality simply invite their own destruction, and anyone who insists on remaining in a state of innocence long after that innocence is dead turns himself into a monster. The time has come to realize that the interracial drama acted out on the American continent has not only created a new black man, it has created a new white man too. No road whatever will lead Americans back to the simplicity of this European village where white men still have the luxury of looking on me as a stranger. I am not really a stranger any longer for any American alive. One of the things that distinguishes Americans from other people is that no other people has ever been so deeply involved in the lives of black men and vice versa. This fact faced, with all its implications, it can be seen that the history of the American Negro problem is not merely shameful, it is also something of an achievement. For even when the worst has been said, it must also be added that the perpetual challenge posed by this problem was always somehow perpetually met. It is precisely this black-white experience which may prove of indispensable value to us in the world we face today. This world is white no longer, and it will never be white again.